Hi everyone. How are you today? I hope you are always healthy. Welcome back to my channel. Like always, today I'm going to discuss about the advanced technology of the past. I got this on Larry's Telegram channels, Tartaria and History channel. Please check the description to know more about his channels. Some might say that I'm being repetitive by discussing this information. But that's the whole point. This is proof that a small occult elite of a to make the history to fit their narrative. Anyway, I also have a Telegram channel. There, I will share various information that I cannot share here. Don't forget to subscribe to my backup YouTube channel, the links is also in the description box below. So, without further ado, fasten your pants, and let's get started. Cambodia is a country full of the old world. Angkor Wat is the largest religious complex in the world by land area, measuring 162.6 hectares, or 401 acres, or more than three times the area of the Vatican City. Even in Angkor Wat today they call it a Buddhist temple complex, which is odd, considering it has Hindu architecture and depictions of Hindu gods all over it. Any Buddhist statues or depictions you find there, which are of a poor standard, have been added in the last few 100 years. The official narrative is that it was originally dedicated to the Hindu god Vishnu, and then 50 years or so later, they decided to convert it to Buddhism. The story isn't very plausible, especially since they did all that work depicting Hinduism throughout the complex. What do you think? In folklore, a willow the wisp, or ignis fatuus, Latin for giddy flame, is an atmospheric ghost light seen by travelers at night, especially over bogs, swamps or marshes. Today this is often referred to as ball lightning. Growing up in Ireland, my grandfather always told me, this was a spirit that would trick people and lead them astray. He said he would always carry stones in his pocket at night, in case he ran into willow the wisp, as it would somehow put a trance on people and lead them to their death, like in a river or lake. These stones were meant to be thrown now, and then to break you from the trance, like if you heard a splash, you know you were in danger. Before I continue the video, please give a like if you'd learned something. And, don't forget to subscribe, and also, click the notification bell too, so you won't miss any update. And, watch to the end, to avoid misunderstanding. Thank you. There's a reason why gold was worn commonly in the past. Now, it's only royalty and so-called holy folk that use gold in their crowns. Gold, mercury, and other conductive metals played an important role in the structures we look at today that were harnessing the ether. Here in some old photos from Cambodia, we see people that still use gold and not just for decoration. Could they have still been connected to this energy? Whether they knew it or not, I'm sure their ancestors did. From what we see in this picture, the royal palace in Phnom Penh is still connected and harnessing either. What do you think? The punt gun is a type of extremely large shotgun used in the 19th and early 20th centuries for shooting large numbers of waterfowl for commercial harvesting operations. These weapons are characteristically too large for an individual to fire from the shoulder or often carry alone, but unlike artillery pieces, punt guns are able to be aimed and fired by a single person from a mount. In this case, the mount is typically a small watercraft. Many early models appear similar to oversized versions of shoulder weapons of the time, with full-length wooden stocks with a normal-sized shoulder stock. Most later variations do away with a full-length stock, especially more modern models, and have mounting hardware fixed to the gun to allow them to be fitted to a pintly. This version is from Wikipedia, I personally think they are mixing truth with lies. In the images you see what look like mini cannons on the punts, not extra-large shotguns. 
Did the Giants use guns? We have spoken about giants many times through this channel. Herein we can see an elephant hunt depiction from 1578 by Jan van der Street. We can tell that it's an adult elephant from the tusks. If the proportions are correct, then that would mean, these are giant men who ride giant horses. What do you think? The consul Atilius Regulus, when encamped at the Bagradas River in Africa, fought a stubborn and fierce battle with a single serpent of extraordinary size, which hid its lair in that region. The serpent with its large mouth seized many of the soldiers, crushing them to death. However, after a long fought battle, they managed to finish the serpent off. The soldiers measured it to be about 120 feet in length. A giant serpent, rumored to inhabit the Lake Lagarfljot near Agilstadur in East Iceland, does exist, announced by the majority of the Truth Commission established in 2012 by the Fljotsdalsjord Municipal Council. It was concluded that the video was authentic. Jordrik Gerald shot the video outside the back of his house in the early hours of the morning. There has been documentation in Iceland going back to the 1300s about these creatures. Our history of strange beings and creatures isn't as black and white as we were told. What do you think? Double horned so-called Indians found. Skulls with two horns. In the 1500s shows common horned people and rams headwear. Two-sided headdress to cover horned women. Hundreds of documented two-horned beings in ancient pictures was a common feature of so-called royalty of the times. This is where they get the nonsense idea of horned so-called devils found worldwide, hidden past shows multiple type beings lived alongside humans. Multiple giants were discovered in Pennsylvania. Several well over 7 feet tall 8 feet, 9 feet, 10 feet, many with two horns. Hidden past. Did Michelangelo really make an error due to translation? I guess we'll never really know. Art historians love to debate the horns of Moses. Michelangelo's famous statue of Moses at St. Peter in Chains in Rome depicts Moses with two horns. Most claim that the horns of Moses go back to St. Jerome's translation error in the Latin Vulgate. I'd like to challenge that assumption. Not only did St. Jerome have reason to translate the horns of Moses, Michelangelo had reason to carve them. And when Moses came down from the Mount Sinai, he held the two tables of the testimony, and he knew not that his face was horned from the conversation of the Lord. And Aaron and the children of Israel seeing the face of Moses horned, were afraid to come near. What do you think about this video? Please like and share this video if you like it, so that more people are aware of what is happening in this world. Before I end this video, let's say thank you to everyone who took the time and energy to research this. They have done a lot for us all. Please subscribe to watch the next upcoming videos. Thank you for watching the video until the end, I hope this information is useful for all of us. See you in the next video.